All right. With all that out of the way, let's get to the reason that we're here tonight. I'm super excited to introduce my friend Gib Biddle. He uh, is a PM expert. I'm sure a lot of you have read his articles and seen his talks. He's a product advisor, um, formerly VP of product at Netflix, formerly VP of product at Chegg. That's his Twitter handle, at Gibson Biddle. And he's going to be sharing, I'm excited, he's going to be sharing a brand new talk with us on how to amplify your products. And so with that, join me in giving Gib a warm welcome. Hello, people in the room, somewhere in Mountain View. Hello, online people. I want to talk about a bunch of stuff. Cool. Um, oh, Dan, do I have to do something to make my slide show up on these screens? Nope, they're there. <laughs> okay. Uh, everything's going to be 20 minutes later, um, but I'll, I'll talk a talk. I'm from Boston, about an hour, um, and uh, the online peeps. Every, actually, everybody in the room, just freaking pull out your mobile device. And I, I used to have to explain how to use a QR code <laughs> pre-pandemic. Luckily, like you know what to do, because um, I do try to get to know both the in-person and online audience. You can ask questions. Uh, you can rank them, et cetera. But a couple of just easy ways to begin to get to know all of you and your level of enthu youthful enthusiasm. Was uh, Netflix launch of ad-supported product, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Simple question. I'm, um, well, tell me more Well, they're answering the question. Yeah, so is it a good thing for consumers? And is it a good thing for the CFO at Netflix? What's, tell me your name. Karsh. Karsh. I, I'm going to come back to you. This is a great start. Um, and Karsh, is Netflix's launch of games? Many of you may have noticed that you can play games on your mobile device. What do you think? Good idea, bad idea? OK, somebody over here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll I'll be clearer on some of these questions a little bit later. You guys know how to use the tech, and we've got 49 people out there. Now I do a little Slido shaming. 49 people online. Make sure you answer the, these damn questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Netflix aggressive policing of password sharing. A good idea or a bad idea? You think this is bad for consumers? Who's it good for? What if Netflix makes more money and can invest, instead of 18 billion a year on original con uh, for content, they can actually invest 20 billion? Could that get back to you as a consumer? Have you actually, how aggressively do you share your account? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess, I guess I got my answer. <laughs> okay, this is the most important question for me. Very long. Just want to know where you stand. I, someone earlier said that I was a living language, a uh, living legend, and I said, "Yes, I am living." <laughs> the legend part, just nobody would have known anything about me until I started writing, after I stopped working full time. Okay, um, but writing is a great way to get your ideas out, and frankly, most of my writing, my first drafts are horrible. And it's getting feedback from you that, that's been super helpful to me. OK, I need to. So I was an English major. It was super good, good for me to write essays about other people's writing. Um, and then really what I want more of are these two things that force you to commit to your ideas and thinkings and then get feedback. By the way, no one knows the answers to any of these questions. And then really, it's the discussion and debate that helps us all form this idea of better product sense. OK, I'm going to dive into it. I get bored easily. This is what I'm going to talk about. Um, just to know, Dan, he could have said, Gib is retired. <laughs> okay. So I just finished the, the PCT with my wife, Kristen. That's uh, 2,600 miles from Mexico border all the way to Canada. 
Um, yeah, it's a big deal. And then I'm very reflective. This is my mom and dad. They got married a long time ago, but, but my dad just passed away. He was a teacher, and you probably know that I'm a teacher. He's also a Harvard MBA, very data analytically oriented. And my mom is a palm reader, <laughs> okay? So I somehow got ended up with these blend of sort of qualitative skills of reading people, and then my dad's highly quantitative um, skills. And these are the kinds of things that I think about. OK, when I joined Netflix in 2005, by the way, th today's presentation is I'm going to try to get a group discussion going. It's going to meander a little. It's going to feel weird. And my main thing is to get you engaged in the conversation. Because this is the beginning of a meandering discussion at Netflix in 2005. We sat around and we played games on the PlayStation and just talked about what it was to do stuff on TV-based stuff. Because our guess was in a few years, that's where we would enable people to watch. Back then, they called it downloadable movies, downloads. It's coming back again, actually. It's interesting, downloads. Um, it, because nobody knew what streaming was. They thought streaming was streamlining, and that sounded bad. So that's just a very sort of organic conversation. And finally, we launched 300 really stinky titles in 2007 only on your Windows-based machine using Silverlight as a DRM, which a couple of people know that was really bad. And then finally, TV a year later. And the point of this is that inventing the future is wicked hard. And these conversations keep evolving at, at Netflix for a variety of issues. What's next for Netflix? So the, I, uh, I, I'm full of tools, models, and frameworks that have been helpful for me when I would go to work every day. So the product vision was to get big on DVD. We did that. And then to lead streaming. And that happened. And then the next was to expand worldwide, when you no longer had to worry about DVDs by mail and integrating with post systems. And what was next for Netflix, the next big step? And it was original content. And then what's next for Netflix today? Yeah, and they've been whinging about. Uh, you know, I think they're now more broadly talking about expanding into other kinds of entertainment. Um, but let's see what the wisdom of crowds here. Just to, to help you bring it up, you, you see the unlimited movies, TV shows, and more. <laughs> so they're not exactly sure how to talk about it. Um, so what is next? If I force you to commit to one thing on this list that you think Netflix should invest in heavily today, what would that be? Dan, the online count went from 49 to 48. Can you find out who left us? <laughs> wow. Live TV. But by the way, this conversation is happening every day at Netflix. So who here thinks that live TV is, would be great? And who th here thinks it would not be great? The opposite. Anybody thinks it's a bad idea? What, what, why are you suspicious about this? OK, so Netflix makes an $18 billion investment in stuff that, that people can watch, they hope, for the next decade. Do you happen to know how much uh, Peacock paid for the rights to the NFL playoff game last week? 100 million, about. And how many viewers did they get? 23, 23 million, exactly right. Okay, so that's, you're right, that is the scale of it. And how many have ever watched a, a year later a football game? Very few, right? Okay, but this is a real conversation that's happening at Netflix today. I'm actually fascinated. Tell me more about the business model. That's how they manage to maintain their market. 
Yeah, that, that all of that's true. But in the history, they they often switch back between that percentage and and fixed fee up front. Um, but but to your how, how do you feel about these live sports? I think it's very dangerous. Okay, so. Do you think Netflix will engage in this in the next five to 10 years? Maybe, right? And so honestly, Netflix doesn't know the answers. And you can see the signs of experimentation all over the place. They've experimented with live already with some of the dating stuff, right? And they, they broke, right? OK, their technology didn't scale well. I can't remember which it was. All right, so today, they, they just call it broader entertainment, OK? Because they're not exactly sure. How many of you played Bandersnatch? That was interactive games, right? Like it, they, they did maybe five or six of those for grown-ups and probably a dozen for kids. But that's not the holy grail that they expected. Now they're very focused on mobile games. How many of you have played a mobile game on your Netflix? OK, that's uh, for the online peeps, it was like 20% of the room. OK, so the insight from the, the discussion that's going on really today <sighs> Reed Hastings, the chairman, would say, why would you put up a lemonade stand in front of a gold mine? He's saying, why the hell would you consider something small like podcasts, which I noticed very few of you were on board with. <sighs> the biggest issue is you are at the whim of the leagues. And right now, the NFL is making a ton of money. The, the sport is very economically rich. But they say yes to you this year, and the next year they drive the price up by 50%, right? You don't control your future. The whole, so by the way, we tested and actually executed advertising circa 19, uh, 2005, 2006, 2007. We did a big ass, that's not a technical term. We did a big A-B test to see if customers would be annoyed by big ad banners. And it didn't hurt retention. Striking, right? OK, so come back to the advertising. What is the value to a customer of advertising? Lower prices. For only 7 bucks a month, you can watch anything you want all the time, right? How many of you are on an ad-supported plan at Netflix? And do you enjoy that? How many services do you, do you subscribe to right now? Yeah, so he's got seven, all about five, seven bucks. That's feeling okay to you, right? Yeah. Oh, he's, he's saying that very few people are advertising, right? Okay, so what does the CFO at Netflix want? Does he want more or less investment today in advertising? He probably wants more high margin dollars. He's saying, why don't we... Why don't we test advertising with all members, well, irrespective of whether they're on an ad-based plan? Because all those live TV people, the advertising people, they, they want to they have real access to everybody in the room. Can you imagine the debates that are happening today at Netflix? Go ahead. I don't have. Insight on that, I have a little insight on Hulu that I'll come to in a minute. Um, and then games, Netflix, if you watch every one of their earnings call, it's a marathon. They're just trying to develop the DNA of what it takes to create a good game. Does anybody like any Netflix games today? In the room, I saw 20% have tried it. Anybody like it? Yeah. What are you playing? They had the GTA Yeah. And you enjoyed it? That's sort of the beginning, and that's the first whisper. Okay, in 2007, when Netflix had 300 shitty titles on the platform, you hope for one person saying, "I actually watched this and I liked it." This is how it started, and it'll take a long time before Netflix has the DNA that that some people from Electronic Arts are in the room. It just takes a while, and that's the way they think about it. Okay, so a couple of questions when when I was evaluating these different ideas. What's the problem that we're trying to solve? What's the problem that Netflix is trying to solve with these additional ideas? Yes, they want to grow more. They're growing about 10% a year. They'd love to grow. Gosh, there are probably 250 million people worldwide, and there's probably about 8 billion people worldwide. Like, 
eventually they'll be there. That's, that's their thinking. Is it big enough to matter? So live TV, you, you, you all assume that it's big enough to matter. I agree with you. It's a worthy experiment for Netflix someday. Podcasts, probably not, especially if you look carefully at the financial performance of, of, of podcasts at, at Spotify. And then you recognize the head of content from Netflix, Ted Sarandos, is on the Spotify board. He knows it, right? <laughs> and what does success like, look like? You'll notice for everything I do, I'm always attaching a metric to it. What would your guess, what percent of revenues at, uh, are coming from advertising at Netflix today? What would you guess? I, I actually heard the answer. Single digits. I think it's closer to 5%. And how do you feel about that? And it's really their first year. They've gone from 0 to 5% of revenues in that first year. Would you invest more or not? I think so, right? And you're seeing it already. OK, and so why did Netflix engage in ads? They came out of COVID about a year ago. The world opened up again, and so did the theaters. And they had their first drop in subscriber growth ever. So when that happened, which of these three forces did Netflix need to prioritize in order to get financially healthy again? And my definition of this is engagement is build a frickin' better product. That's all it means. And at Netflix, they measure engagement by retention. About 2% of their members quit every month. And when I say growth, that's how many subscribers do you have in the system? And when I say monetization, are you creating revenue or profits that en enable them to invest more in the future of their own content? OK, who wants to make the pitch for why engagement's the most important thing here? Yes? I'm going to summarize it. It's the product, stupid. Just build a freaking great product, and all of these things will fall away. You'll, you'll get your growth, and you'll get your monetization. Who wants to argue the opposite? Another point of view, either supporting growth or supporting monetization. By the way, this is so wickedly low stakes. Okay? If you want to practice boardroom conversations, this is a freaking good place. Okay? Nobody's going to stop. I am not going to say, what were you thinking? Okay? Let me know if I do, Dan. Okay. Yes? He, what he just said is 2%, only 2% cancel every month. That's a freaking great product. So the focus instead should be what? Growth. Okay? Who wants to be the CFO monetization? Yes. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, more profits, but, but more growth will also... Do, why did Netflix get hammered? Why did their stock die? There is, there is a certain subscriber growth dropped. For the first time, they lost their subscribers. Go ahead. There's a certain saturation. Did you hear that? She said, this is not forever. How many, uh, uh, five years from now, how many subscribers will they have? <laughs> OK. Do you think they can continue 10% growth every year for the next five years? Who are these people? <laughs> OK, so what's fueling Netflix growth? Smart TVs connected to, to high bandwidth internet. Turns out that most of the world doesn't have that yet. So this is the argument that over time, you can get to a billion subscribers. Okay. Okay. And do, does anyone know the answers to these questions? No, there's no answer. Okay. So the important part is the discussion and the debate. Can you feel me trying to loosen you up? To let me know what you think. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Here's, here is what Netflix is doing. They've put growth first. That's the, growth first. 
and then they put monetization second, and they've put engagement third. Like 2% is pretty freaking good. By the way, uh, 2005, it was like 5% canceled every month. It has gotten substantially better over time. Okay. By the way, I'm trying to give you shared language so that we can have an intelligent conversation and debate. Go ahead. Great question. What the hell, did, where, where does content fit into this mix? What would your answer be? Okay, I, okay, good. Okay, so tell me more. Uh, a different point of view? Yeah. I feel like, you know, as a population in Asia, yeah. if you want a new population, it's probably in Japan. Okay, this is the point. If you're really trying to get from 250 million to a billion, let's focus on young people, yeah. right? And, yeah. like, how, I bet you the young people are feeling pretty good about some of the mobile games, some of this other weird experiments. I mean, they, they have the data to support this as well. well. Why not try and run? I'm not saying they shouldn't, <laughs> right? But the main thing is, uh, even Netflix has limited resources, and any time that you can force an organization to force rank these choices, how do you prioritize growth versus engagement, call me a better product, and monetization, you're providing a lot more clarity for everybody in the building. And that's really all I'm trying to do. Go ahead. Why isn't cost cutting what? It is. That would be monetization for me. So if you're reducing the costs or generating more revenue or profit, those are all the elements that I think about in monetization. But his point was good. If you make retention better, that helps you to monetize a lot better. So these are a little bit tricky to disambiguate. And you can see why it takes a long time to have, really have these fights <laughs> about how you think about priorities. So I've just shared with you, I call it the GEM model, those three factors that I have found to be helpful for anyone I've ever worked with. So advertising, the problem they were trying to solve, reaccelerate member growth. Uh, they think they can get 20% incremental revenue with it in five years. Is that worth investing in? Shit, yes. Okay. Um, can I swear here? Yep. Thanks. Um, success, they, they, they want to be lifetime value neutral with 15% annual member growth. And so far, they seem to be on pace for it. And it's hot within the company. CFO thinks this is awesome, and all the product people are saying, I don't know how I feel about this. And you can imagine the CFO saying, hey, why don't you do a big A-B test where you do an ad for a theatrical new release to all members, not just the folks on the ad-supported thing. Can you imagine how that feels to the product people? Wait, wait a minute. They didn't sign up for advertising. They're paying for the service. Right? Can you imagine the debate? This is going on today. Yeah. Yep. Why not? That, that's a great question. So I already told you, remember, Netflix did advertising. Right? We needed it desperately. Because that's how we generated our first profits. This is back in 2007. And then 2008, Reed Acey, the CEO, walked me around and said, hey, Gib, that's really cool that, that, that we generated our first profits, but I want you to kill advertising now, which is to say we had figured out how to make the core business more profitable. And then he looked at me and said, Gib, who's going to be the best in the world at advertising? I said, Google? He said, very good. And then he said, what do you have to be the best in the world at? And I said, personalization? He said, yes. And so, so we killed it then because we didn't need it. But in this case, what you just saw a year ago, they needed it to reaccelerate growth. So things change. And by the way, there was no right answer at any of those time periods. Yeah, but I think that the why now is because their growth stopped and they needed something to get it going again. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. Yep. How do you decide which 
or where to put the ad and uh, what so, type of ad? So first, they're going to have the discussion. Then they're going to debate it. And then they're going to agree on the first big A-B test that they're going to do. And then they'll look at the results. So everything you do an A-B test? And well, actually, that's a great question. Did, didn't Netflix test advertising before they launched it? I don't think they did. I think they just did it, OK? And actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re let me reveal some of the things that I saw. So I'm just trying to get you ready. Uh, I, I work with lots of different companies. You have a strategy. You have a plan. And then I call it consumer science, but you experiment. Because nobody knows the answer. So we'll experiment. And then what I'm focusing on today is product sense for me is about developing good judgment. That's really all it is. And I, I care a lot about company culture because it sort of creates an operating system for how people make great decisions without talking to each other, which I think is wonderful. I was talking to some folks while having pizza. I, I don't work at very big companies because the rules and processes start to weigh me down. And I love how culture creates rule it doesn't re require rules and processes people make great decisions independently so these are the things that i'm interested in <sighs> if you're a product leader it's very helpful to have great judgment about business people and the product and that's where product sense comes in for me and i assume that 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 all of you are product leaders and it turns out that whatever level of leadership you are, you're expected to have an opinion about everything, right? If you come in as a VP, the first day at work, they're going to say, what do you think about this? That's hard. I'm trying to give you a safe place to practice this, by the way, today. And I expect product leaders to craft a compelling swag, a stupid wild ass guess. If it's better, it's a scientific wild ass guess quickly. You'll notice I've already shared two different models with you. Okay, one is the delighting customer in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And that last one was the gem model in prioritizing growth, engagement, and monetization. Because at the end of the day, leaders lead. So you can't follow <laughs> all the time if you want to be a leader. And that's, I'm trying to give you a safe space to practice this stuff. Uh, Dan did a little on my background. I really am largely retired now. I'm, I'm kind of loosely coming a little out of retirement. Really, my, my greatest joy is teaching. I am a one-person company, and it's just great fun for me to teach. But uh, when I was working, and I was very much at the beginning of electronic arts, my electronic arts friends in the room, yeah. It was, I, I, I can tell you where the body, bodies are buried. OK, so I, I gave you a, part, uh, a little bit of a sense of what I'm trying to talk about, and I'm going to talk about it more. <sighs> Lenny's newsletter subscribers, people in the room, yeah. I, I think it's great. Um, but this is where I was starting to chew on. Is this product sense? This is an important idea. I still haven't exactly decided, but I, I can define what I think it means um, and how you can develop better judgment, some hacks, if you will. This was asking thousands of product managers, what are the important skills to have? That third big one with the big arrow is product sense. And those little area arrows, I think, are all things that go into developing product sense. It's hard for me to disambiguate all the things. Communication first. So I'm trying to give you tools, models, and frameworks to help you communicate. Execution, here's that idea of product sense. Strategic thinking, I'm trying to give you some strategic models to think with. And then down at the end, I put the word empathy, um, which came out. But that's really just, usually it's qualitative, spending time with customers, really trying to get inside their heads, ask why, why, why. And this is just, a, a, Lenny and Jules Walter did a great essay. I'd recommend reading it. Maybe, Dan, you can find it for the room at some point. Uh, but they just broke it down a little bit. It's about empathy, really getting inside people's heads. It's how, what are generating lots of ideas that you hope will somehow build a better product. And it aligns really well with my models. For me, the product leader's job is to delight customers in these hard to copy. That just makes it so you don't have to worry about your competition. Margin enhancing ways. And margin is just how do you build a better business. So delighting customers and doing it in a way that makes sense for the business. 
And, and this really is the foundation for all the strategic thinking that I do as well. So today's product conversation, I'm trying to give you, I'm trying to give you some ways to have intelligent conversations and debates about products. That's what I, I call it, name it, detain it. How, like, how, how, how do we develop shared language in an organization that lets, lets us work together on these problems? By the way, when I ask you a question and you don't know the answer, this happens to me a lot. The CEO will say, what do you think, Gib? And I'll, I'll, I'll just start asking questions. But, okay, what do you mean by this? What are your goals? What do you think is important? I'll just eat, ask questions, ask questions, ask questions until I, it's, sometimes I'm stalling a little bit, but I'm also trying to get more context for what an intelligent conversation would look like. So a hack with me, if I cold call you, I do it often. It's okay to say, tell me more <laughs> or ask questions, okay? And I'm, try, I'm actually hoping you'll leave the room tonight and use some of these skills in your work. When we talk about product, what are your sources of data? Like, he's work, he, you're using seven different streaming services, right? He's got a lot of, like, this is how Peacock does it. This is how Netflix does it. This is how Hulu does it. Like, that's amazing data and information. Some of you might have asked your 61-year-old parents, like, what do you think of the service? That's just good qualitative. I sometimes, I watch all of the earnings for Netflix and all these different competitors. That's where I'm getting my, some of my quantitative data, and occasionally I know what an A-B test was. These are the sources of data that you can add to the conversation. And then today I'm just trying to get you to talk about this stuff comfortably with everybody in the room, hoping you'll do it at work as well. And create the same experience I'm trying to create here back at work. Great Wonders was one of my first startups that I was competing with the, the Bruderbunds play, what was it called? Playroom, the Playroom. And then built a product called Elmo's Preschool. It was a full preschool curriculum in a box. What would you rather have, the Playroom or Elmo's Preschool? Like, that, that was an insight that worked. That's the main insight of Netflix. All you can eat for one monthly subscription. Not, not very fancy, not too tech-based or anything else. Chegg, let's rent students textbooks. Let's rent it for 50 bucks instead of making them pay 200. Yeah. Yeah. Always, yeah. Well, so when I was at Netflix, we, the, the goal state was to A-B test everything. Uh, I'm just, my remark here is they, they chose not to A-B test advertising, mainly because there were so many role models, notably Hulu, that just demonstrated it works, okay? Um, so they didn't need to know it, and they also guessed that it would help them to grow their revenues quickly, and they were correct. Um, the question is, would they do a fallback? Would, would, well, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, we all have our own sort of secret skills. Like, most of the people at Netflix are quantitatively gifted, and I was the English major. And... And so my way to keep up was to understand that, you know, all the quant, but I was purposeful. I would spend at least a half a day a week with normal people um, doing a lot of qualitative. And that's where I was more gifted. And that was my way of trying to add to the conversation, which it was helpful. Boy, it's just, now you're taking me back. Um, so the reality is I, I would spend a day to, 
one to two days a week recruiting to building teams because I'm always engaged in the super scaling. So um, when I was at Netflix, we went from about 100 people to about 3,000 people. So that's how I would spend one or two days a week on just building out teams. Um, half day a week on qualitative, probably a, a day on the quant. So I would be helping to design A-B tests, reviewing A-B test results, trying to set up metrics that were quickly and easily readable and all the time through these different sources. We're trying to develop insights that would help us to form our new hypotheses that we would put into test quickly. Uh, and then if I left out maybe a day, it would be sort of high level strategic thinking, making sure that the strategy for the company, the, the product, and each of the swim lanes. So if you were the product leader focused on streaming or on personalization, your strategy was clear. I don't know how many days I used up. Okay. Oh, so these are some hacks. Like I spent a lot of time looking at other people's products uh, and thinking about you know what's good, what's bad. Who's who's got a favorite car in the room? What's your favorite car? Who's got a Tesla? Okay, how do you like your Tesla? You love it. My wife it drives her crazy that all the software keeps changing and she doesn't know how to turn on the windshield wipers. What do you think of that? What did you just say about my wife? <laughs> Is there anything that bugs you about your Tesla? Uh, I think the range. The range. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, so these are the kinds of conversations you can have about any products. I actually was impressed by how many of you are writing already. Because that's been probably the biggest hack for me to, to help refine my thinking about all this stuff. I tend to spend, like, my conversation with my wife, she says the software keeps changing. I'm like, that's because Tesla's little now, and it wants to be used by the whole world. So they don't care about you and me, the tech-savvy audience. They're trying to create a simple experience for all the newbies. So Kristen doesn't like the changes, OK? But this, this, the, the same thing, it's, it's usually the, 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 you, there's a rich stuff to mine when you talk to people about their first experience with your product that I find incredibly helpful. How does the Tesla make you feel? Pretty good? Like, give me more. Oh, how does that make you feel? <laughs> Alive. Oh, goodness. This is, these are the kinds of questions you ask to really get into the richness of products. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Is everybody in this room writing for the public? Is this, is this true? How many of you are writing for the public? <laughs> so that, that's where I'm coming at. You know, it's like there's a lot of bad content as well. Bad written content. Tell me more. Yeah. Hey, guys, I just realized from now on, we're doing a lot of interview. Just raise your hand, and we'll do it, because otherwise it won't get on the recording. So go for it. Yeah, and we'll get you a mic real quick. Go ahead. I mean, I was just trying to frame that uh, there's a lot of content out there. A lot of people are writing it. So you get insights when you write something and people comment on it or challenge it and you have a debate and a discussion. That's so, true. Uh, yeah, and I, the, the truth is I often work out my ideas in a forum exactly like this, which is really what I'm doing right now. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then you get to decide if it's good or bad, but I, which is totally cool. And you'll have lots of feedback for me. So I, I found the same thing through writing. Sometimes I write first, and then I develop a talk or a workshop. Sometimes I do a talk or workshop, then I do the writing. Um, but it has been, it has accelerated my thinking. Like today, I'm giving you a low stakes way to say what you think. No, no one will remember, OK? Writing's that next step where it's written down. And by the way, I edit my stuff like crazy. I love it. 
I mean, I love that. Well, why write a book? Because then I can't edit anymore. OK, go ahead. Well, let me get you right. Are you writing now? Thank you. So I'm going to give Netflix an idea. Yeah. And these people are my witness. So when they adapt it, <laughs> I'm Why don't you for go the in real check. close there, Bill, with the video? <laughs> I'll be waiting for the royal check. Thank you for commenting before me in regards to writing and how people are more engaged. Now, how about every 10 minutes to 15 from a movie or whatever series that's playing, there's people that subscribe only to pause it, where then they share their ideas and their take on what they watched together. So like you put them in a, in a portal special yep. for them yeah. where they engage as they watch. Because sometimes a man does not like to be disturbed by his wife right, while right. watching something. Okay. So, or, or people, right? What, what is your name? Bashir. Bashir. So Bashir's bravely shared an idea. Does anybody want to build on that idea and say what, what the good in it is? And let me add, the writing would be on the screen. Now you're selling. <laughs> this is good. But by the way, I have a lot of data on this topic I'm going to reveal in a second. Uh, oh, you, you, you seem, go ahead. Do you, want to, you don't want to build yet? Well, no, it's, what is it, 30% of people are communicating on social media as they're watching this. That's great. So let's build an experience that enables more of that better and keeps them within the Netflix fold and probably improves retention because only Netflix does this well, right? D didn't they do a Netflix watch party during the pandemic? <laughs> Isn't it similar to that? And yeah, so these are some of the sources of data. Did you ever do a Netflix watch party? I did. T tell me about your experience. Um, I watched it with a, I was doing my MBA, so we kind of, our program had to stop because pandemic hit and we all went home. Yeah. So we used to do Netflix watch parties. Um, and it was okay, you just party. told me you're not a normal person, but keep going. <laughs> I mean, like, the, keep going. Yeah, but that, I, I think we use it once or twice and that's it, but never okay. wanted to continue. So she's got a little bit of qualitative based on her experience that, that this wasn't helpful. I have another one. Did anybody ever use Netflix Friends? Like. Everybody, would, this is uh, when Facebook was growing up, you know, the idea was that you would share movie ideas with your friends. I'm totally with you. I'm just giving you some data, okay? It was only used by 2% of the audience. Now, if Netflix is trying to improve retention, what do they think about things that are only used by 2% of their audience? Not worth the investment. Very nice way of communicating that, okay? How do you feel about 15 percenters? Yeah, 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 yeah. T totally with you. Okay. So, but, but, sh and now should Netflix experiment with this vein again? It, I'm going to call it social. Is that okay? Yeah. Should they experiment with social? Well, I mean, actually, the best argument for that is those darn 12 year olds who are the future of Netflix as they go to a billion, right? Let's try it with 12 year olds. So does anybody know? Just to TikTok. Yeah. So TikTok. Oh my God, TikTok is huge for video, isn't it? They're used to TikTok. And <laughs> video is shorter build. at TikTok, but Netflix yeah. has series. And we can engage them in much more meaningful things Let me, through something familiar to yeah. them. Well, let me uh, ask like the TikTok. chief product officer level question. Should Netflix invest more in social than it does today? Because? OK. And social is all about marketing, advertising. Yeah. OK. So this is a good CPO level question. Because right now, Netflix is investing very little in social. Yep. Um, would you hire a director of product manager focused on social to experiment with? OK. How many agree with that statement? Interesting. OK. OK. okay. By the way, the counter argument is I just want to watch the movie. <laughs> okay, that is the hidden insight, right? Okay, uh, I'm going to push on. Um, so I'm just going to share Netflix's strategy today. I'm, I'm trying to bring these conversations together. If I were at Netflix today, uh, I'm just going to say, boy, we've come a long way. So exciting that Beef just won three Emmys. Has anybody watched Beef? Okay, 
Like, it's amazing that a DVD by mail service can put out a quality of work like that. It's really pretty darn cool. And then I'm just going to reiterate the strategy for you. I'm going to do this weird thing where I pretend I'm the head of product at Netflix, and then I'm just me. I go back and forth. It's a little. <laughs> but this is just a reminder of the positioning of Netflix. It's all about movie enjoyment made easy. Okay. By the way, does that have to be changed? Yeah, maybe. OK, product vision. We've already done this. Boom, 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 boom. And now we have a series of experiments that, with broader entertainment. Okay, And we, and we don't exactly know what's going to work, because we tried a bunch of stuff. And this was like the interactive stories for kids worked OK, but not a big deal. This few people loved it, but not a big deal. We're doing mobile games, and we're maybe making some progress. And we're going to get to all these big game platforms. And we've got Exploding Kittens, where we've got the animated series for kids. And we're, I know some of the people, we've got the card game. We're doing it all, OK? OK, and this is how we prioritize these three forces. Still this way today. And this is just the reiteration. As product leaders at Netflix, your job is to delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And the one metric we care about most that defines our product quality is retention. And we feel pretty good. And we've making big investments in these five areas. Big. And for each, we have a metric that tells us exactly how we're doing. These are the things that we believe are going to keep adding to retention improvements. And these tactics are the projects that we're engaged in today. And I call this the SMT, the Strategy Metric Tactic Model. And I, I reiterate this every month until people can play it back to me. This is what alignment looks like for me in a product organization. And here's a rolling roadmap that shows how these ideas are going to play out over time. And do I really think we're going to deliver exactly what I say every quarter? No. We're going to learn so much in Q1 about our experiments in advertising. Of course, they're going to affect our thinking in the future. So a roadmap is just for me, it's like a guide. I'm trying to help you understand what these five words on the left side mean. And the update. Well, interesting. You felt, how do you all feel about 5% of Netflix members are engaged in a game at least once, a, uh, 30 minutes a month? How do you feel about this? Wait, how many are impressed? And how many thinks this is shit? Okay, it's a start. Okay, okay, okay. That's a fair statement. So are you going to keep the same level of investment or invest more tomorrow? More. Okay, how many want to invest more in games? <laughs> yeah. Okay, by the way, so this is, the, again, this is one of the conversations that happen again. And nobody knows the answer, right? And by the way, I deeply appreciate that you're, you're pitching in. Go ahead. Okay, great. So she's questioning the metric. Okay, what do you think the metric should be? Uh, you know, number of members, percentage of members that are playing like one hour or thirty minutes per day. Okay, so she wants a daily active user. Go ahead. Yep. OK, are you making the beginning of an argument why Netflix should kill their gaming investment today? Is that where you're going? OK, so you're saying 5% is not good enough yet. Go ahead. We really want to look at the categories of members, right? Yeah. For example, older members versus younger members. If, if we've got 80% of 12-year-olds engaged, how are you That's feeling? That's probably a pretty good thing. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Nick, give, does that people just raise their hand real quick? We get people on mics, so we get it on. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, the video is not going to be good. Yeah, I was just asking, uh, what is the breakdown of 5% on mobile versus PC? Or a, it's uh, all TV? mobile. It's all, all mobile. mobile. Yep. I mean, that's the only thing they really care about so far. Very 
strategic first investment. Go ahead. Can we ask if that 30 minutes are accretive or, or incremental to watching videos? Because we wouldn't want to take away from. Uh, let's do a simple yes, it's accretive. Yeah. Our, our hope is that this will improve retention. And retention improvements are very powerful for, for the business, for the monetization. That's what we hoped with streaming, it worked. That's what we hoped with original content, it worked. And that's what we hope for games. I'm sorry. I, I have Dan's voice in my head saying, use the microphone, Gib. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I got it. How long did it take to get to this 5% there? I mean, if it took you one month, then no, you have exponential about, growth there. It's, so. it's 18 to 24 months. Okay. Okay. So you're not going to double down. You're going to wait and see. I'm going to nix that. Oh, you're, she's a killer. Okay, great discussion, great debate. How do you feel about like six months of effort, 5% of revenues from advertising? Okay, pretty spectacular. Okay, keep investing. Anybody want to double down on this? Oh, good. Okay, take all of Gib, the investment Gib. in games and put it against advertising, correct? Gib, I have a question for you. Yes, go ahead. I'm looking at those two numbers. And given 15, 20% growth year over year in revenue, I can do that with advertising an existing business line and international growth. What is the games thing about? Is it, is it the future, the next S curve that I'm worried about? Is that why I'm investing it? So it's yeah, R&D? Yeah, really good question. So notice I haven't said that advertising, I, di I didn't make that part of the long-term product vision, okay? It's an enhancer, and it's, it's really enhancing. I'm not saying the next big step. I think you use that S-curve thing. To, to answer your question, we're hoping that the games are going to be that next big step. And actually, I was sort of relieved. I already revealed something about Netflix culture, which is a marathon. It's going to take time to develop that DNA, which you know, I would say it took Netflix at least five to eight years to get good at original content. The company's patient, so they'll probably give the five to eight years for the games as well. Whew. I'm just trying to introduce one other concept here. Early at Netflix, there's going to be a set of activities that I'm going to, this is the language they use on the board call. This is the walk. This is the baby steps. There's some basic stuff that they have to do and are doing. And then over time, it's going to be the run stuff. Because in a minute, I'm going to ask you to talk with your peers about some run ideas. Um, that's it. That, that's really what I'm trying to. But how do you guys feel about the advertising update? This is a board meeting. Give me a thumbs up or a thumb down. I think it's pretty spectacular. Okay. But can you feel the tension? Because the CFO wants to do more. Because actually, that, that studio, the um, TV advertisers are they're like, we need more eyeballs, right? Like, we want to do this with everybody you got. You can just feel the tension. OK. Uh, I've already told you this history. We very, we stayed out of advertising forever, right? And this is the why now. I already told you that story. And I told you I'd give you a little insight about Hulu. And I told you I'd give you a little insight about Spotify. It's weird. Spotify is a little, they're, I think they're hurting. I was a little surprised that they're only doing 15% in ad spending. So, and I think podcasts are really killing them. Yeah, for sure. Okay, um, I wanted to come back to your very first question was, who, who's asking? Can you build the argument of why advertising is a very good thing because it delights customers, 
in hard to copy, margin enhancing ways. What is delightful about advertising for customers? It lowers my cost. Netflix subscribers can have this service with anything they want to watch for seven bucks a month. Is that delightful? I think it is. I mean, are you delighted? <laughs> okay. What would make it better? Oh, so he's nicely saying that the 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 way advert it's wonky. You want a feature like uh, YouTube does, where I click to 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 get to close the ad out because it's not relevant to me. Correct. Got it. And frankly, the stuff that you're seeing, you don't give a shit about, right? Are there any advertisements that have intrigued you? I see. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm buying so much shit on Instagram right now. Like, how did they know I wanted a new ski rack? This is amazing. Okay, go ahead. It intrigues me when they listen into our discussions and then throw the ad next second. I see. Well, so I think there's uh, Netflix could create a much better, more delightful average experience in the long term. What's hard to copy about Netflix's doing this that none of their competitors can do? I mean, it's their own platform, so they have proprietary data in that sense. They do. And do you think in the long term, using all their personalization technology, they can do a fundamentally better job of helping to connect advertiser with just the right person? Yes. And that's a very hard to copy advantage. And we already know that this is good for the business. So I, I think they're going to double down on advertising because it delights customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. How does this affect the Netflix brand, good or bad? Tell me more. OK, so the statement is I'm going to sort of dummy it down. Ad suck. <laughs> OK, tell me more. So you think it's going to hurt the Netflix brand? Yeah, because. I can see, I see ads everywhere. I want to come to a platform that doesn't have any ads. Okay, so and that's just, why I bought Netflix. I know, but you're paying 10 or 20 bucks a month and you don't get any ads, right? Mm -hmm. We got you covered, no ads for you. No we're, soup for you. Right, but we're kind of, I think you're losing the differentiation that you have from a streaming platform. If everybody else is doing brands, or sorry, ads, yeah. then let's, let's stick with like, we focus on users and okay, ads. Okay, this was the argument for ten straight years. This is you got it. Okay, go so, ahead. So when we look at the number five percent, what we're not looking at is retention. Is it affecting engagement? If the, uh, Netflix is ending up losing customers to other services that are also ad supported, then you know his point stands. Otherwise, uh, we need a guardrail and metric to look at okay. as well. Okay, so by, by the way, you could give me a full list of questions that you want Netflix to answer in the next year or two, right? And no, no, I mean, I'm good. That's the way Netflix thinks. Okay, we're going to get smarter, we're going to get better. When are they going to answer the question of this is bad for their brand? Or is that an answerable question? Go ahead. We watch Super Bowl ads because they're cool. Okay. So that's going to take a few years to develop that DNA where you're actually delighted by this content you're watching. Okay? I mean, can you think of moments where you've been delighted? Like, I, I, this has happened to me on Instagram an amazing amount of times. I didn't know there was a little thing that a magnet I could stick on the side so it holds my skis up. When I'm taking my skis off the roof, like, whoa, this is great. <laughs> okay, that, can ha that was delightful. <laughs> okay, Who's, who, who are Netflix ad based programs competing with? Think bigger. Think bigger. Think bigger. Yeah, no, TV advertising, which really sucks. Okay? I mean, remember, you guys are all freaks. Okay? You all have your connected TVs, your smart TVs with broadband access. But other people are still watching ads that just show up on their linear TV. Um, all right. So this is how it played out. So this is the last earnings call. Reed's very supportive. Like he, he did a mea culpa. I said we shouldn't do advertising for 10 years because it was going to be too complex. 
but I realized I got it wrong. You know, this is about giving the person who hates ads, you don't have to watch the ads, and giving the person who values the $7 a month program something much more valuable. So this is all about consumer choice. Uh, how long is Netflix going to work with, with uh, Microsoft's ad tech program? Probably not that long, because <laughs> they're going to they're going to build their own platform and tie in all the personalization data. But it was a great way to start, really fast, great way to start. And how it has worked. It, so look at the green line going up and to the right. You know, it's gone from maybe 100 million uh, market cap. To, I'm sorry, 100 billion to 200 billion. And this is one of the driving factors. So it's worked out nicely. OK, what did they learn from all this? Customer choice is more important than simplicity. That was Reed. Saying, that's his mea culpa. Like Netflix knows how valuable it is to keep things simple, but here's one idea that trumps it. And this is now built into the product sense of everybody in the building. They didn't A-B test because they knew it works. Not doing this now. Okay? It's going to be really weird when a bunch of salespeople in the building at Netflix, right? And they're going to maintain that focus on personalization. The personalization is going to be good for you at 20 bucks a month, and it's going to be good for you at 7 bucks a month. Place to all. So they're doubling down at this point. OK, so this is my little update to the company. Thank you. <laughs> and then ad strategy. So I just, I just want to do oh, just a teeny exercise. So you, you got this. Growth first, monetization second, engagement third. You got this model. You understand your job is to improve retention. You've seen this. You've seen this. The only thing I did different was I said, you know what? We're going to commit a whole frickin', I call them swim lane to advertising. So you're the, the leader of advertising efforts. And I just want you thinking, I only want you thinking about one thing. And really, all I'm <laughs> doing is giving you a moment to talk with some peers in your row. Okay? What are the ideas that Netflix should execute when they start running faster in their advertising? This is what it looks like today. Notice everything you want for seven bucks at the bottom. You set up your account. You choose this. And by the way, I got two versions of this today. Here's the other version. Okay? I mean, they're they're a B testing. Like I just keep clearing my cookies and I get new stuff. Okay. They're trying to figure all this stuff out really quickly. Helping people, what's the data you need to decide which of these three programs to get? Hey, where are you gonna watch? And then they, they're they're trying to get you to build out your profile as a new subscriber right out of the gate. They're trying to get three or four profiles from each family. Now you know my birthday, so you can send me nice wishes. And I only speak English and some bad French. And it's just light, like, tell me a couple of movies you like. OK, cool. So that's what it looks like today. The walk, I kind of gave you a sense of what the walk projects are. I put them on that roadmap. And then what I want you thinking about in a moment are the run activities. So, hmm, you know, how are you going to help them to innovate faster in the next year? or two. That's really the only thing I want you talking about in a second. So you're the leader for ads. I want more run ideas. And then I'm also going to ask you as the CPO, how do you prioritize these pretty big efforts? Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to talk with each other. Um, and you can use this to throw your ideas. So. Uh, everybody online, start doing your work. I want to see a bunch of really amazing ideas on this slide. It, it's populated now. People in the room, I want you to awkwardly turn to your neighbors and talk about how Netflix is going to innovate on, on these run type activities in advertising. Talk to each other. You're trying to build your community of peers in this room.
Can you chat them, chat with the online peeps? Okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, tell me Which the truth. They've already lost. Yeah. Advertising is 3x more expensive. When, when you had 100 million subscribers on Fast, yeah. now you can produce your own content. That's, I can show you the numbers on this. OK, well, so, so I'm sorry. Uh, let's come back to. to you, you, do you subscribe to the New York Times? Or I do. You I do. Free content, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Paywall? How many people are doing paywall versus not, right? Yeah. If you stay subscription only, you end up being a focus play. Okay. Okay. So you're you're just you're making the argument for why Netflix should be doubling down every year in this area. It's economic. Yeah. Point. Yeah. And what ne they haven't had is the scale and fast. They haven't had yep. to generate their own content. They have shit content of the first 300 on Netflix. Yep. When they cross 100 million monthly active users, they can afford to start making their own content, their own content library. Okay. That's this transition that is being missed in all this conversation. Okay, so you're just giving another reason that Netflix should be investing more and quickly in, in these eventually free model. Almost. The, model, the yeah. point is it's out there, yep. and we're not talking about that as my point. But I'll call you about this. I'll yeah, yeah, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind myself of your name. I'm going to show you the spread. It's Arthur. Fine. Yeah, yeah, no, I got it. But now I'm going to show uh, you the spreadsheet okay. I put together. Good. It'll be fun. Thank you. Go yep. Hey. I had one. Yeah. Yeah, that's me. So one awkward question here, right? So throughout this talk, I've been trying to pick up nuggets which I can, you know, use in my day job. Yep. And I, I'm not able to map that. You know, what in this talk? Wait till I my do? last slide. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. I answered the question for you. <laughs> but thank you for asking it. <laughs> Okay, but it's still on, right? Yeah, okay. it's, it's on. Okay. The um, Zoom recording is clean. Yep, yep. Okay, we're going to bring it home. Do it. Do any, uh, do any of these groups want to share a few ideas with the room? Yeah. Yeah. Stand awkwardly, and here comes the mic microphone. Well, actually, it's... So I want to start with a question, though, which is um, oh, that's good. You know, which, yeah. which is more around um, instrumentation of effectiveness of these ads. Yeah. Um, because you know, getting impressions is one thing. Totally. But is conversion something? Yeah. That's so part of this puzzle. Yeah. I put and, that in uh, all in a set of instrumentation analytics and the walk activities. Yeah. It's just the basics that yeah. Netflix is barely doing today, and that's my definition for walk. But did you have some interesting run ideas for us? Um, yeah, so so I think um, when we were sort of talking, it, it sort of, you know, the, the thought process there around um, if we're getting conversions, how do you engage more meaningfully with the audience? I mean, obviously, product placement is a portion of the original yep. content in yep. the series. But the question is, how can you actually enhance that customer journey? And it could apply to the not ad-backed areas as well, where you provide an incentive for people to buy. And yep. it's more directly linked back, because now I see. you want to tie it to the sale. You want to tie it to the yep. thing somehow, Got it. and then you want to actually. That's a run activity you know, for yeah. Netflix today. It's certainly a run activity that Instagram does exceptionally well today. I feel like, yes, they like do. Uh, yeah, I'm buying a lot of crap that I probably shouldn't have bought. OK, uh, can you hand the microphone? So uh, what we discussed here was that probably Netflix has an opportunity to reinvent advertising content, because um, 
I talked about when I was growing up in India, our ads were so fun and engaging that we talked less about the shows we were watching, but the ads that we saw and the recall and the brand stickiness. I don't, I haven't seen that in the U.S. at all, uh, other than Super Bowl. Yep. So knowing that they know how to do content, they know they have personalization already. They need to be that place where we actually people pay to watch advertisements. And so what is your two to three word, word summary of this idea? Have great advertising. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, microphone front row. <laughs> I'm slow to learn. <laughs> so uh, we talked yeah, about... Go ahead. We talked about maybe like also having seamless ads, but then I thought like the, the whole point of doing this ad thing was to reduce costs for some consumers and give them choice, right? So yeah. uh, what if we just go full in on like targeted advertisements so the cost goes down even lower for the customer? Okay, so, so you eventually like to get to a place, could you offer a free service to customers? Right. Because the advertising is so rich. And I, I think that's going to be a vector that Netflix is going to explore. Yeah. Okay, a last uh, microphone. Uh, actually, can I get you? Uh, yeah. So we are at fifteen dollars a month per person. Um, is there a world we can imagine where the our pool is unlimited? Can we imagine a world where Netflix ads lead lead to shopping? Will anybody ever shop something while watching a Netflix show? And can we take a cut out of that? And now we're talking about unlimited ARPU. Maybe that's okay. where. So what's your two to three word summary? Two to four. Ads, shopping, payments, all in the app. Just okay, like as TikTok a way to this. get higher revenues from advertising, right? So it's, it's like, yeah, I, I, think, I think these are all good ideas. Okay. So I just, I, I did a quick swag um, to fill out that SMT lockup with a few walk activities and a few run. And I did a quick swag of the roadmap. And my, when I say quick swag, I did this in three minutes. Okay, and this is really the power of tools, models, and frameworks and shared language. And the only, I, I, the only other new language I gave to you today was walk and run, which, in watching the earnings calls, I found a very helpful way to understand how Netflix thought about their beginning their first baby steps walking into ads and how they're going to expand their stride over time. It was a helpful communication technique. Okay, so I'm bringing it home. You are the chief product officer at Netflix. I want to hear after all of this discussion, how would you prioritize these efforts? Force rank. The one at the top will be what you believe is the most important. And the one at the bottom is the one that you believe is the least important. That's really all I'm looking at. And if you're online, it would be super helpful if you could give us your insights. And I'm just quite curious what the wisdom of crowds will be after this. And if, if, if you didn't get my memo, these are live, current conversations and debates that are happening in Netflix. You can feel them just by watching the earnings call. And I just find it all fascinating. Okay, um, does somebody want to tell us what you see? I need the microphone. Um, I get tired of talking, so if somebody, yeah, please. Stand up awkwardly. What, what, so anything here surprise you? Nothing surprises. Um... Well, so I love the personalization because it benefits everything that Netflix does, right? And it's one of their most important hard to copy advantages. They actually understand the movie taste for about a billion people today when you look at all the profiles that are tied to each account. Keep going. Well, I chose personalization because through personalization, you can channel all the other stuff. If you don't know exactly what your customer wants, then you can't really focus what types of ads they might choose. Yep. And you can't really know what content might keep them retained, might keep them coming. And also, viewing experience is important, so you have to be creative on all levels, regardless. And uh, then, if it's personalized, also you can choose the right games and stuff like that, and grow the game gaming industry in that regard. So, so one of my surprises is just so we we've talked people in the room out of games. 
Is that, is that what you see here? Is that fair? I mean, it's interesting. I, I always love to know the, the reason I've used that product vision idea of get big, expand, expand, expand um, is from an investor point of view, you always want to tell them what the next big thing is next. You guys see the value in advertising, but I, I just want to know what's the transformative next step is the way that original content was. Did you have something? Um, Go ahead. I'm surprised that original content is on at number three. Um, especially, I mean, I'm, Netflix is a place that has subscribers and yep. can license other people and, you know, can uh, be the channel to have other content creators. And, and they're doing more of that now. So uh, wouldn't, in terms of investments, uh, is original content number three or is it games? Are you starting to feel why it's hard to be a chief product officer? At the company has 10,000 employees, but you still, the, the resources never feel unlimited. And that's really the value of these sort of forced rank prioritization. OK, I said I was going to bring it home. I really am. Um, <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> OK. So how, how do you improve your product sense? You keep trying to predict impact of every project you do. My encouragement is use that lens. Is it delighting customers in hard to copy, margin enhancing ways? And is it creating both customer value, delight, and business, the margin? And then you're always thinking about what sources of data do I have to inform my prediction of whether this project will work or not? It could be something that your wife said, or it could be based on you know, your subscriber to seven of these projects. Spend time talking with your peers about this stuff. Good fights make good marriages. I have been married for, oh God, 32 years, OK? Um, but just, I, I was just trying to give you license to talk about this kind of stuff with other product leaders in the room. And then I was trying to give you license to generate lots of ideas, because you're, you're hoping to weed out the 5 or 10% that'll really matter. Uh, I tried to give you tools and models and frameworks that give you ways to have intelligent conversations. I thought it was a very intelligent conversation. None of you have watched all the damn board meetings, you know, the investor meetings, the way I have. Okay, but this is the real value of these tools, models, they and frameworks. They help you to have intelligent conversations and debates. As a product leader, you are storytellers. And that's the real value. Remember how important communication was? And that's the real value of these tools and models. They help you to tell a story. Like, you now have a story about Netflix and advertising and why most of you think it's a good idea. Where my guess is before you came in the room, you're thinking, this is shit. Like, why is this important and helpful? And as a leader, storytelling is incredibly, it's the why I, as an English major, ended up being a product leader at a bunch of different organizations. And then I loved how many are engaged in thinking and writing already. But I was trying to create a risk-free environment that I hope that you can recreate at your work, where you can have these conversations, these discussions, and then these debates. We're using collective wisdom and whatever. You can really isolate what you think are the projects that have the most impact. Because at the end of the day, this idea of product sense is about having a good intuition for what projects are going to move the needle and which won't. The answer is never clear, and it's really, really hard. You could see Netflix struggling in games, for instance. Um, really unexpected result. OK, uh, awkward, awkward, awkward. I've just spent my time trying to breathe fire. And uh, now I want your feedback. So you know what to do. Um, it's a 0 to 10, 0 sucks, 10 is great. I would love it if this is feedback on this talk. I would love it. Uh, the question is, what was one thing that was good about today's talk? And then what was one thing that could be better? And if you could just put in the notes whether you're in the room or online, it gives me a little bit more context. We've been trying to do it all tonight, which is really hard. Have a live talk 
with an online audience, and then make Bill happy, because Bill's trying to get a video of this whole experience. It's never been done before, but we'll see how we did. Yes, there'll be a recording. When will the recording come out? Oh, I asked the wrong question. Of the when Bill has time. When Bill has time. Oh, forgive me. <laughs> no, it's okay. Do you want me to enforce <laughs> um, I know I gave the link to the PDF of this talk to Dan already. So when will people have access I to it? I can the... put it in the chat right now. and I He's can... going to put it in the chat right now. Yeah. Uh, Bill, I'm going to commit to putting the PDF in the chat right now. Um, and the video recording edit will be done. Do you want me to give you an hour or how long does it take? That's a joke. Bill and I worked together like four or five years ago. He did the first recording that I ever did. <laughs> yeah. Nah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much for your feedback and thanks a ton for being here. It's kind of fun to be in person yes, with people again and have pizza. Next time I'm wishing for beer. Um, I, I, I will answer some questions. I answer all questions. I do this Ask Gib newsletter. I haven't been writing for seven months because I was hiking the PCT. Um, so. Cool. And we, again, just raise your hand so we can capture it on um, the questions on the video. And I'll be looking, monitoring chat people on Zoom on chat. Feel free to put them in there. Or you can do it on the, the Slido. You can use Slido to do it, too. That'd be great. And, Dan, thanks yeah. a ton for hosting me and us. I know that these, pleasure. these are labors of love. And this labor of love has gone on for how many years? It's going to be 10 years in March. 10 years. And I noticed... Bill in the room after yes. 10 years. I know it's George in the room after 10 years. Mm -hmm. Rohan as well. And Rohan, yes. yeah. there he is. Okay. Yeah. And who was the person I, that let me in the door tonight? Preeth. Yeah, Preeth. Preeth is, is he here? here. There yeah. you go. And, so anyways, thanks yeah. so much for the, the labor of love activity. It's awesome. All right. Awesome. Well, let's give a good boy round of applause here. Let's go. And then we do have time for Q&A. So you can get it on the Slido and then... Um, Raise your hand if you're here, and then we can we'll get it on the videotape. Yeah, do it. That's, that's okay. Can I go ahead and ask my question here? I'm if you have a yeah, microphone, you got a mic you, yes. on the stage. Uh, <laughs> I'm awkwardly trying to figure out who you are. There. Oh yes. <laughs> um, I can't believe I haven't heard you speak before. You're wonderful. So thank you for the talk. Well, I am still alive. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Um, I am curious about um, a pricing question and. During the peak of the pandemic, when uh, Netflix was pretty much pe what people were relying on when people couldn't go out and do other things, and probably there was higher activity on Netflix, but also at the same time, a lot of people were losing their jobs and income was low, I was surprised to see price increases at that time, monthly price increase from a company that's already, I think, profitable at, in that moment. So I'm curious to know what the thought process might have been behind price increase at that time? Yeah, so good, good question. Historically, Netflix was like McDonald's, um, which is to say performed really well in tight economic times, recession, what have you. Uh, but you're right, in the last few years, um, their price, actually probably the last five to eight years, the prices is just going you know, up by a little, like a buck a year. Um, and so a couple of things. Netflix knows what the result will be because they're price testing all the time. Just keep clearing your cookies when you sign up for a new service, and you might discover that you're, you're going to get a lower price. Um, so they kind of know the answer. Um, and frankly, they've been learning a ton about worldwide pricing. So it's very different theories in India versus the U.S., for instance. Um, and oh, the, the main thing is they are trying to do a better job of funding their own content. So all these price increases are going right back into more content. Um, I think it's that simple. I think I was just wondering more from an ethics point of view when people are losing jobs and it's just a bad time for the world. Um, but again, it seems like it didn't really impact them negatively. I would have expected that. Um, just curious from that standpoint. Yeah, it's funny. I was trying to remember if I've ever heard a, a conversation about ethics 
Well, I sort of have entered uh, the conversation at Netflix because the A-B test results are telling. Um, OK, I'll tell you the main thing. In the old days at Netflix, they were really afraid to do price increases because every time they did, they, they had zillions of people leaving. And then they learned how to execute price changes better. So I don't know if any of you noticed this, but you get an email. It's usually about six months before the price change saying, hey, we're going to increase your price by a buck. And then three months later, they remind you. And then two months later, and then they finally freaking do it. So they've learned to over communicate this bad news. So they've managed the price changes really well. They used to do a horrible job of it. So I think it's just given more, them more confident to figure out what the right answer is via A-B testing in each country, and then just to execute better. When you listen to the earnings call, I mean, they, they're, they're used to some flight when the price goes up, but it sort of evens out in the long term. So I can't really give you more insight. OK. okay. That's good. Thank you. Yep. Um, so how do you evaluate product inside a product sense when you're interviewing people? Uh, start simple. What's your favorite product? Why? Oh, that's interesting. And then I usually try to, to triangulate to a place where I know the product that they're talking about. And then we have a conversation like this. Oh, tell me more about your Tesla. My wife hates her Tesla because they keep changing the software. <laughs> My sister-in-law hates Tesla because Elon Musk is an idiot. You know, like, oh, OK, so now we're having a conversation. Um, I mean, that's usually that's among my, actually, one of my first questions, I'm just trying to figure out if people are creative and if they like to build stuff. So like, tell me more about what you did last weekend. And if they tell me they, they cooked dinner for eight people, I'm like, oh, tell me more. You know, that's a fundamental creation project. Or they built a tree house. Like, tell me more. Uh, but, you know, tell me, tell me a product you hate. Tell me a product you love. That, that helps. And then we just talk about stuff like we did here. Um, well, why, how could that delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? Like, <laughs> the good news is they've usually, they're kind of prepared, for, they've read something that I've written. So they're like, can I see all your questions in cheat sheet? <laughs> and does your uh, evaluation also depend on the level of, of, of hire you're making? Oh, for sure. Um, uh, does the, uh, you know, levels, so the, yeah, I, I have a different set of questions for hiring leaders at a, like a VP. So with startups I work with, I'm helping them to evaluate the head of product. And um, you really, most of my conversation is about strategic thinking. And then their real leadership skills. So their ability to help change a product or change an organization. So it's actually a, an essay I wrote years ago. It was called Hacking a Product Leader Career. It shows what I, how I interview candidates at all levels. So it's almost a Thank checklist. You. It almost spells something. Yeah. One second, please. Um, earlier, we had this conversation about advertising or gaming. So um, how do we, I, and I understand that it is important for revenue generation ads is one of the main ways to do that. But again, n not everyone is used to, I mean, a lot of people chose Netflix, I think, to somebody's point earlier, because there are less ads. And I sometimes I watch, for example, MasterChef on Hulu, and I hate ads. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's a, they're losing some customers there. And therefore, we chose, um, you know, we switched back to Netflix. Yeah. Um, so how does um, somebody in, in that um, product management, management area for advertising um, make a pitch to, in order to bring um, advertising as their key uh, revenue generator? As their key what? Revenue generator, it's, it, because that is going to bring revenue to them. So how do you pitch that to, um, you know, uh, to the CFO, for example? Well, well it's, in this context, the CFOs can, they're going to, I'm confident that the CEO of Netflix is wanting more and more and more 
of advertising. If, if Netflix has hired a product leader for advertising, they're gung-ho on it. I think, I think there's the two questions that are going to be hard for Netflix to tease out. One is the branding issue. So does it, does it really create negative value? And that, that's a really interesting question, and I'm sure they're monitoring it. But the other one is, how much should the company let the advertising team invest? Should they let them do an, a, an it's only a test, uh, for a 30-second ad for all members, for some theatrical release that the theaters are paying, whatever, 50 million bucks for? Like, how does Netflix decide how much, how invasive the advertising product should be? And that's probably, for me, that's probably the most in interesting question. And what are the metrics that are, that are you going to use to, to, so to deal that? So is there a way to sample some of the users? Are, uh, what is the best? Yeah, they will. They will. T I mean, so I, I tested advertising ages ago. Everybody thought it was going to be horrible, and it turned out to be great. And most people didn't even notice it, right? Um, I, today, I'm not really sure how to structure that test or that conversation. Uh, but I'm sort of waiting for, I'm, I'm in the most expensive program. And I have bought sub profiles for both of my daughters because I felt guilty. Um, but I'm waiting to see the first time I'm in a test where they're presenting advertising to me. So we'll see. I think that's inevitable. What is the sample size that they typically run for running tests? And a how billion. Long? No, I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's the right number of people to see if there's a difference at some statistically significant level. And how long would they run the test? It depends. But for instance, the pricing tests, um, they, they always have pricing tests in the background, and it's those customers are getting it for their entire lifetime. Uh, I mean, that's just, Netflix is always engaged in this balancing act between price and value. Um, and they're pretty smart about it today. Yes. Uh, you gave us a lot of really good frameworks and um, approaches for product sense. I'm curious for people in B2, B2B, if there's any modifications or asterisks for developing product sense or, or doing that? Well, I mean, um, wrong person to ask. However, I will point out that Netflix, they, they actually have, they've had two audiences for a while, their, their customers, but also the studios. Uh, and so the, they actually have a pretty big studio organization. Think about, they're, in, they're helping all the studios digitize their assets better. They're helping them to turn it from one language into 20 languages with good uh, dubbing. I mean, so they, they've had a sort of business customer for a while. And that's why I think they're going to handle this advertising customer pretty well. Anyways, uh, B2B, there's lots of differences. Like, for instance, I um, most B2B companies don't like to share that four-quarter roadmap with their sales team because they're afraid the sales team will wait for that next thing to come out. Um, and they can't A-B test as effectively. So it's more about the, the strategic thinking. And it works well for this one customer. Do we think it'll scale to? Lots of them. Anyways, I'm really I'm, I've been doing B two C my entire career. There's a lot of There's yeah. A lot of yeah, yeah. I should. You know what? I should have done the professor thing. Like, that's a great question. Does anybody have insights on this? <laughs> so, what were you going to say? A lot more, lot more qualitative customer advisory boards. Like most of the B two B companies, yeah. have customer advisory boards, and 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 basically your your PM and a customer just two in a box. And but you have to really trust that customer. That was a much better response. Thank you. I have a question around pricing strategy. Um, how did they get to like seven ninety nine? Uh, aren't they concerned about cannibalizing the premium tier? And is the advertising revenue like how do they map that to that seven ninety nine value? Yeah, it's, it's uh, so I was actually pretty impressed how quickly they iterated. Um, so I th 
a couple of things. I think they were surprised by the initial traction. I think they started at five bucks and then they moved up to, to the seven bucks. And then I think they were surprised how many dollars they were getting for the advertisers as well. So, I mean, what they essentially did was that they have three plans. The ad supported, I think it's like, it's like 15 bucks in the middle and 22 at the top, uh, where it used to be like, so anyway, I think they've been really impressed by how many dollars the ad supported plan is delivering. But you can see it. I mean, I had screen captures of different months of what that price and plan page looked like. And then they've been trying to figure out other minor things, like should you be able to download when, in an ad-supported plan, you know, so you can watch it on the airplane? And the answer, I think, is now yes. Um, should you be able to watch it on all devices? Yes. I mean, the other thing that's been going on is against this context, they've been trying to figure out their um, the sharing model. Um, and they've been iterating pretty quickly. I think my sense is they start in different countries, and then when they're pretty confident, they bring it back to the U.S. Sort of the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, well, they're, they're, they were, Netflix was doing very aggressive, path. so the model was Gib and Kristen, my wife, we have two daughters. Of course we should all share the account in, the, in, the, in our house. Then each of the kids go to college. Well, yeah, let's let them share, just as long as the whole dorm isn't using it, which can't happen, right? Because, um, and then they were using all that capability to get people to trade up to the 15 and 20 and 25. Um, and, uh, and then at some point, they just try to clarify it. It means an account can be used in one house. <laughs> That's really what they're trying to say now where before it used to be more of a family model. And, and they've been pretty good about communicating it. If you look in the, in the price and plan page, it's much clearer than it used to be. And that's that sort of learning of communicate bad news really clearly and often. I'm waiting. Yeah, you tell me what to do. Um, so we talked about podcasts a little bit. Yeah. But my question is, isn't podcasts like a very low investment uh, area because there's already a streaming technology? There is already a technology built into. Totally uh, with you. Yeah, I, th I think so. When I was talking to PCT, I, I, I just listened to podcasts. It's awesome, right? And then to your point, it's very analogous to a movie. It's just a story. It's audio only. Um, so then when I came back, that's when I started spending more time with Spotify and realizing it's a really hard business. Uh, podcast is. Okay. So and then. I did ask my pals at Netflix, and they pointed out that Barry McCarthy was the CFO at, at um, Spotify. He used to be the CFO of Netflix. He's not pro on podcast investment. And then he, he was the one that pointed out that Ted Sarandos, the head of content for Netflix, is on the board of, of Spotify. Spotify, and he's not a proponent of podcasts either. Because to your point, I was like, it's all about storytelling, right? Anyways, it just turns out it's... Like games is a better business, and advertising is clearly a better business. So yeah, and also depends on what time of uh, uh, like if you ask podcast, the value of podcast maybe three years back, it's, it's yeah. not that much. But now commute is back into picture. Yeah. So uh, I was just thinking on the, those lines. Yeah, I, the only thing I've learned is it's just tough business. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have you hit 10,000 yet? Go ahead. So if uh, one of your direct reportees comes to you with a proposal to modify the roadmap, what's the best way to convince you of that? Well, OK, so that context, is it, it could be the product leader for advertising, correct? I mean, the way I think about my job is what's the right level of investment? For, I call them a sweet swimming lane, that viewing experience versus ad versus personalization. Those are the swim lanes. The main thing that I think about is what's the right level of investment? How many resources for each of those areas? And then when should I fight to, to like, is it time to bring social back, right? Um, the product leader, I want them to own their advertising four quarter plan, their uh, strategy, metric, and tactics. I want them to own that. 
and then I'll just be nicely questioning and challenging it. Why do you think this is the best and most important project to do next, right? Tell me more. But, and I, I want each of these product leaders in their swim lane to be the smartest person in the room in their area. And then I'm generally encouraging them to experiment faster. Um, like, what, how could we learn faster? Like, the, the, the pace of learning right now in advertising in Netflix is pretty impressive. And then, unfortunately, if a year or two go by and I don't see re any results against the metrics, then I start asking, do I have the right person in that leadership role? And that's why I spend a day or two a week at fast-growing startups doing recruiting. So, yeah. All right, it's getting a little late. We have one yep. last question, and then we'll just we'll wrap up, and then I'm sure Gib will stick around. You can answer your questions. All right, go ahead. So sort of back to the pricing with the ads. I'm unfamiliar with Netflix ads. Can you skip them? Not yet. Not yet, and um, everyone is everyone views a certain amount of ads. Yeah, it's not. It's probably like. Probably order magnitude like three minutes an hour, which linear TV is probably at eight or ten minutes an hour. So it's not that bad. I mean, in large part because they're not putting enough eyeballs to, to get full attention from the advertisers. All the advertisers want, they'd rather be advertising to all 250 million members at Netflix. Right. Um, uh, I guess I'm just thinking about a more dynamic pricing model where you could select a number of ads. Like for people that are less of annoyed by ads, you could say, oh, you could show me 10. Yeah. And it would be cheaper, or they could be incentivized in some it's way. It's a good run activity. I mean, and today, Netflix is probably putting 80% of its energy into walk activity. <laughs> OK? I mean, that's just where they are. Um, I thought, when you, you asked the question about the roadmap. Uh, no, I'm done. Dan, thanks so much for having me. All right, thanks a lot, yeah. Gib. Appreciate it.